Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam wa ala ashrafi al-mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Nabiina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa ba'd. Assalamu alaikum and good day to all of you. So my talk today will be on Ad-Darura, the Islamic uh, juridical principle of necessity and its application in the field of biomedical intervention. Now, we can also say the Islamic ethical legal principle of necessity. All right. And then um, we won't have much time to, to try and speak about, you know, biomedical intervention. So I will concentrate only on one issue, that is vaccination, which Dr. Azim perhaps didn't have time to complete uh, what he wanted to say, inshallah ta'ala. All right. Now, biomedical scientists, unlike doctors, they do not worry about the day-to-day -day healing of their patients and so on. But what they are engaged in is they're primarily involved in developing medicines and vaccines, and also they collaborate with the engineers. I don't know whether you know, we got one engineer here. I asked him, uh, who are you? And he said, I'm an engineer. He said, my, my, my firm sent me here. It would be beneficial if I come here. So Alhamdulillah, we have an engineer among us here. And then, the, so they assist the biomedical scientists to develop diagnostic uh, technologies and tools. Now, undoubtedly, there's no, you know, no dispute about that. The involvement in scientific advancements in biomedicine biomed does present ethical, legal challenges for Muslims vis-à-vis -vis their worldview. Now, if we look, uh, if we go back, you know, I have the, here, we, we're somewhere around here in Chicago, all right? And then uh, if you look here, then we have the whole world here. All right, yesterday, Dr. Asim asked a question, why bioethics? You know, and uh, whatever we're discussing from yesterday until tomorrow, inshallah, then it's applicable to Muslims all over the world. All of us, you know, residing in any part of the world, it's relevant to what we are discussing. All right, so now the responses that we have here to biomedical challenges. Now, we spoke about that from yesterday. We're talking about consultation that must take place between within uh, the Muslim scholars and the medical fraternity. So we have started that quite a while ago. And we have what is known as Islamic uh, juridical councils established all over the world. Even here, I heard there's a new Amja, it's called. They have established now. Uh, not, not so long ago. But in South Africa, we've tried to, but unfortunately, we have not been able to establish such a body. So now, what is, what is happening is that there's a sort of a move away from fatawa, Islamic religious decrees over individual muftis. And you know the term they, they look, they say that we go fatwa shopping, you know, from one, we don't like this fatwa, then you go to someone else and so on. So now what we have is a better thing. We have a council, and this is a good thing, is that if we are going to discuss about medical, then we bring people involved in medicine to come and educate the, the, the Muslim scholars. So they educate them, they explain to them the procedure and so on, and then they are given time to retire. And then they come, they come up with makalat or, or you know, articles, come back to the forum with the doctors and everyone there, and then they debate, or they read out and there's debate. And finally, they come to what is known as kararat, you know, resolutions that they take. And this, I think, has more value than the fatawa. Now, let us go, since we're talking about darora, and try and unpack you know, the theological construct of darura. So it's an Arabic word, and it's derived from the Arabic word darar, 
which implies an injury that cannot be avoided. Technically then, and this is important for us to understand, technically, it legitimizes on the basis of chaos, analogical deduction, the suspension of what has been deemed as prohibited in terms of the Sharia, Islamic law, on the ground of necessity. However, and this is a caution on our part, the ethical legal principle of necessity is not absolute. While the aim of the rura is to ease the mashakka, the difficulty, its relevance is contingent upon the condition which in the first place allowed the infringement of the Sharia uh, prohibition. Hence, once the condition falls away, the exceptional rule of necessity will no longer be applicable. And this is very important for us to bear in mind. Now, the script, scriptural basis of a darura. We find uh, the Quran, the Quranic ayah in Surah Al-Anam, chapter 6, verse 145. The first part speaks about what we as Muslims are not allowed to consume. In the last part, the exception is made, you know, out of darura. So we mustn't relish it, and we mustn't eat to the full, you know, but actually we just for us to be able to maintain our sustenance or life. So this is justification for Muslims to consume that which is haram prohibited out of the rura necessity. Now I'll give you an example, another example, but from the hadith of Sayyidina Muhammad al And uh, this is somewhat different. You know, if someone comes in South Africa every day, we have a problem. You know, you may be parked somewhere and then about to take your car, then they come with guns. You know, they want to hijack your car. And this is what we live with every day in our lives in South Africa. So now it will be suicidal on our part to try and not give the key and try to defend, to protect our car. But if we do that, even our family, you know, if they come home and they want to hurt the family, we are alone, we try to defend. Then if we do that, then we'll be raised to the status of a martyr. That is what he says, yeah. Completely different. So out of darura to defend your property, defend your family, and so on. Now, let us come to the issue of vaccination to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. And our brother explained that very beautifully and the laws that is being put in place, no one will be able to, to violate the laws, you know. So the relationship between bioethics and vaccination revolves around the issue of autonomy. In choosing not to have oneself or one's children vaccinated out of fear that vaccinations have the potential of harm, to harm one's body and that of their children versus the greater harm that may ensue as a result of non-compliance to mandatory vaccination. So this is uh, the, the understanding on, on the part of the scientists. Now, for, for us, the Muslim dilemma is a problem because there is some ingredients in the vaccination, in some of the vaccination, the pork incident, uh, ingredients, which makes it doubtful now whether it's allowed for us to have our children vaccinated with these or not. But then there are some scholars that argue that on the basis of necessity, then it would be allowed for us to make use of the unlawful. And the, the argument they put is the change that happens in the process of, of creating the vaccine using pork ingredients and so on. But there are others that believe that no matter is uh, the pork is intrinsically uh, impure, and therefore you cannot change that. You cannot, it cannot transform itself. So that is why we find there's a mufti in South Africa who, I mean, categorically states that if the government of Saudi Arabia insists upon you to take the vaccine, then you should not travel to Saudi Arabia because you will have within yourself something which is impure and your Hajj will not be acceptable. Now, I want to move a little bit away. We talk about Darura, but I want to broaden the context. You know why? Because Imam al-Ghazali, 
when he came up with uh, the high objectives of the Sharia, he actually called them the Ruriyat, necessities. So it is a necessity to preserve religion, your deen, necessity to preserve your life, necessity to preserve intellect, necessity to preserve progeny, and necessity to preserve wealth. So on, on using the argument, the broader argument of, of uh, the objectives of Sharia, then we'll show you how actually vaccination fulfills the preservation of all these five high objectives of the Sharia. So preservation of religion, Muslims uh, who are vaccinated against the vaccine preventable diseases will be in a better position to uphold and practice the, all the faraid, obligatory acts of worship. I don't know whether you, you were reading or whether you read in the time when there was opposition in Pakistan about uh, the polio vaccine. You know what happened is, you know, you read these stories and you want to cry. There's a father who spoke and he said he opposed his children from being vaccinated. There were three of them and they, they became inflicted with polio. And the, the wife was pregnant for the fourth time. He said, I couldn't resist. You know, I couldn't resist, but I love that my child, when the, when the child was born, to be uh, vaccinated against polio because you cannot stand and pray like we stand and pray. All right, this is only one example. And preservation of life, vaccination initiatives by facilitating, facilitating universal access to safe vaccines have succeeded in the preservation of lives of millions of people across the globe, thereby reducing global morbidity and mortality. And there's a reality about it. If you read about WHO, you, you'll know about all that. Now, preservation of intellect. Preservation of intellect sanity is also achieved through vaccination in that those who implement the vaccination initiatives in their community and country at large will enjoy peace of mind knowing that their community and citizens have been protected from contracting the vaccine preventable diseases. And uh, as far as the progeny is concerned, parents who opt to have their children vaccinated will have fulfilled the preservation of their progeny by safeguarding them from succumbing to vaccine preventable diseases. And finally, uh, uh, the preservation of wealth. Vaccination actually contributes in the preservation of wealth. It is an extremely cost-effective intervention and makes good economic sense in that it is always better to prevent a disease than to treat it and its resultant complications. And finally, I conclude by saying that from the fatwa that we have, uh, yeah, Islamic uh, legal decree of an individual scholar, we have moved away to that, to Qararat, resolutions of Muslim scholars. The discourse needs to be broadened. You know, we have in discourses with perhaps in the financial sector, in sec sec sector, Islamic finance, we bring economists and so on. I think we should bring medical scientists or biomedical scientists also in the discourse because whatever they are inventing also impact on the way we look. Today we live in a, uh, in a multicultural, multi-religious society, and I think we should respect each other's views and try to, to help each other. And the Rura, although derived um, from the Quran and Hadith, is not absolute. It is meant to ease the difficulty being faced by Muslims when confronted with an array of biomedical innovations. For example, in the context of vaccines with foreseen elements, which Muslims may be injected with on the basis of a darura for the preservation of life and, and health and so on, will fall away once a viable substitute for porcine elements are included in such vaccines. So, and I would like to say that we have been talking and the question was posed about why Islamic bioethics, all right? But I would like to say that it would be better for us to choose to the term Islamic medical jurisprudence rather than bioethics. And I, and I commend Dr. Padela in the Initiative on Islam and, and Medicine to look into that field because we think that the branch of alf, the, the alf, uh, it's called al-fiqh, al should, should be part of the new 
branch that you should go and should be taught in every daulum, in every madrasa, in every medical school, and so on. Why? Because ethics. You know, when you speak about ethics, it doesn't have a legal implication. In my country, there was a judge who went to India, and he slept with someone else's wife. And when, she came, when they came back, there was a big UN cry in the paper, and he's still practicing as a judge. In the Islamic Sharia court, you would be dismissed straight away. You would never be allowed to practice as a judge. So every principle of ethics that is violated has a legal consequence. You are seen for violating a principle of ethics. Mm-hmm.